What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Supper Suite at TIFF 2022. I've got the team behind, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting on our couch right now, one of my favorite movies of this festival, Sisu. Holy shit. I also have not <laughs> cursed until now. Whole, I'm going to embrace it. Holy shit. Congratulations on what you accomplished with this movie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank right. You so much. Yeah, Maria, I'm going to start with you. I have a feeling you've done this a couple of times, but I have to ask you to give a brief synopsis in case some of our viewers have no clue what Sisu is yet. Well, uh, Sisu is a story about this old guy who finds a lot of gold in the Lapland wilderness and gets to fight with the Nazis about it, basically. <laughs> No synopsis of this movie will do what I saw justice. Um, I was reading about how your dream was to make a an action movie inspired by some of your favorite 80s action movies. So mm -hmm. can you tell us some of the biggest inspirations? I know Rambo was one, but are there any? <laughs> I'm first noticing that now. So Rambo and anything else that uh, made that list? Uh, it's pretty hard to get anything else to that list because Rambo was the biggest one. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, so for each of you, when you first get this script, is there anything that your character goes through that you kind of like circle in red and say that is gonna be the toughest thing to pull off and then ultimately was that the biggest challenge or did something else catch you by surprise when you were filming the movie? Um, I mean, the whole shoot, it's like shooting up in the mountains of Lapland in minus 20 with 40, mile an hour winds and snow and dirt and tank noise and uh, and Yamari very kindly made me shirtless for the first <laughs> half of the movie so you know it was just the whole ordeal of it um but, you know like reading the script for the first time because there's so little dialogue throughout it's kind of like reading a novella like it was like reading a short an amazing short story um and then to get up there and Yamari so precise that everything described in that script is on screen and it's just incredible. Probably because of the lack of dialogue in the in the script, my little monologue felt like <laughs> this is <laughs> am I doing it right? How how will I pull this off? But I believe you were happy. At least it made it to the film, so <laughs> <laughs> from my perspective you nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. For me, it was when I when I read the script the first time, um, I couldn't figure it out if this movie is going, is going to be fantastic or shit because the, the, the script was so crazy. So uh, I asked my agents to get a conversation with Yamari to see if I believed him to be the right like director for this crazy script. Two seconds into this conversation, I fell in love with Yamari and, and the project. There was no turning back. I so wanted to do it. I'd play any part in that movie just to be a part of the project. Many, many follow-up questions. The first, the first thing I'm gonna ask is, so you were concerned when you got the script, and anyone can jump in on this, what about when you hit set? Because obviously, like nothing ever perfectly goes to plan, so was there ever a day where you were all like, like how is this gonna look okay on screen, but it did? No, no, no. Uh, first of all, uh, when I arrived set three days after they started shooting, um, I, uh, called Yamari and I said, like, how, how, how do you feel? How's it going? How do you feel? This is his exact words. I feel like a man making an historical masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, and that is Yamari, and that is how he is. And when you come on set, he knows exactly what he wants, exactly how, what he wants and how he wants it done and made does not mean that he doesn't like listen to his actors because he's super great listener, really, really good director, but it's inspiring to be a part of a set where the director has so much control over his vision and his visuals and his storytelling and his narrative. So just being a part of, obviously, like, like Jack is saying, it was super harsh. The wind was crazy. The cold was crazy, oh, crazy. But just being a part of it, you never, ever wondered if this was going to be beautiful or spectacular ever i have to say that because we'll finish autumn will surprise you and uh, at some point there was snow and it wasn't supposed to be snow 
So just to to see how the well, first of all, Yalmarit made decisions how we're gonna shoot this, and and how the crew could just adjust to the fact that wherever we look, there's snow, and we can't see the snow, and then you don't see the snow at the fair because they were also pro so that wasn't like personal for me but just to look how they come up quite fast with huge like solutions that now we have to we have to film this how are we going to do it and it was it was exciting to to see like how what what all you came up with mm. uh, did you did you good <laughs> Did you ask me something? No. <laughs> <laughs> we always talk about like the big crazy movie magic, but that's the type of like smaller detail that makes all the difference that we don't highlight nearly enough. Um, to follow up on something Axel had just said about the clarity of your vision, can you tell me like the opposite version of that where you had clarity going into filming a scene, but on the spot you decided that that original vision wasn't how you should execute it and you pivoted on the spot. that almost ever happens like because <clears throat> if I have a plan how to do it and I know where I'm gonna do it it usually goes like it should but sometimes of course there's like location problem like you you just don't find the location you you need to do something and that's probably the biggest like then I have to change something to be able to do it somewhere else I feel like every director on this planet is going to want your secret sauce for creating a plan and being <laughs> able to execute it perfectly. Yeah, but also, I he's a crazy, like he's a problem solver. You, I've worked with numerous directors where the, the producers toss like challenges, right? Like, we can't do that. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough money. Uh, we have to move this location because of this and that. There's a neighbor here screaming. We can't be here or whatever. But Yalmari never complains. He finds a solution pretty quick he's a problem solver and that that helps and when that problem is solved it's often a bit better than what it was supposed to be right so so it's uh, film is almost always organic film should be organic it should be um it should be a balance between the ongoing environment what the actor presents and what your visions are but when your vision is as clear as Yamari's vision is you can always, he can always navigate through it because he knows exactly what he wants from every situation, every scene. So the problem solving just makes them, for us, the movie yeah. making more there fun was some, and more possible. Some problems, of course, with, with the horse. Now I don't believe you. <laughs> the, the horses, actually, <laughs> like, that was like living hell with the horses. Like, what the fuck? Going all over the place and and then we have to have some different ideas how to how to pull it off but that was crazy what about your dog the dog do a good the, job follow all the rules he yeah, really keeps really telling us the dog was the best actor on the cast so <laughs> I mean, i'm a big pet lover so i might be you're all wonderful but i might be partial to the dog as well um so you are able to create a plan execute it and you seem to have a lot of confidence in your plan but going into this shoot was there any particular set piece heavy action heavy gore that had you thinking like this might be the most ambitious and challenging thing i've come up with here because i can think of like a laundry list mm. of ones <laughs> we had yeah we had some difficulties many times but uh, the river scene was quite bad, actually. Didn't you have to set the stuntman on fire like far more times than you probably should have? Yeah, of course we did it <laughs> many times, but that's that's part of the plan. <laughs> it looks really good. I'm I'm obsessed with like movie magic, what it takes to do stuff like that, and also I love blood and gore. It's a real artistry, and we never give it enough credit in that respect. So for the three of you, is there anything that you saw happen on this set that made you go like, I cannot believe that's what it takes to make it look like that on screen? My favorite moment was when Yalmari was throwing uh, a f like a limb. It was a foot in the air, and I didn't know there was a part of the director's job but he did well and the the shot is in the movie i feel like limb thrower should be an actual yeah. credit yeah yeah also we were sitting on top of the tank and it was the wind was crazy hard 
And in one, like the first shot we did, uh, there was a lot of sand that was blowing in our eyes. So we were like, uh, <laughs> had to clean our eyes after, after the shot. And then the second shot came and the wind was a bit like, was, wasn't that hard. It was still. And Yalmari goes, where's the smoke? What, what, there's no smoke. That was sand, Yalmari. So where's the sand? So he had two people throw sand in our eyes during a, during a take. So me and me, I'm, I'm supposed to like look at Yorma while, while he's walking past. And then I get like, I get like sand, sand like in my eyes. <laughs> it looks good, but it's just like, yeah. He, that's how specific he is on the visuals. We had a bit of a, a mantra on set, which I take a little bit of credit for introducing which was pain is temporary, film is forever. And I think we all kind of abided by that. I feel like I need that as a tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, bringing up Yorma, I have a question about getting him involved, because I think I had read somewhere that he was a little apprehensive to sign on because of how physical the role was. So what were you able to do for him to make him feel comfortable jumping into a role like that? Well, I, I, I promised him that he can wear the jacket which wasn't the original plan because it was so fi windy and cold. And my plan was not to have like a, like a over jacket for that autumn. I, mean, I still regret it a little bit. <laughs> Why? I think, I think he still looks great, but I understand that request. I would have been a big old baby in the cold. I don't know how you all yeah. did it. But he's a tough guy. Uh, he really is like the, all the shit he came through on, on this film, like, he was in really weird places. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. But you're almost different, though. You have to tell what just I would just I saw about the ADR. Normal people, like normal actors, come into ADR. We put on the mic. We have the mic in front of us. We have the script, and we we do the ADR. But what does Yorma do? What is, does he bring into the into the ADR studio? Because it was like five hour him breathing to the microphone, and he was I need something heavy. I need something heavy, and the recorded guy was like. What heavy? Something heavy. Bring me something heavy. And they find this uh, big piece of asphalt. And he was like doing this bit the whole day. <laughs> Five hours. Five hours. <sighs> <laughs> I respect this great. I respect anyone on this planet, actor or in any other field who can do ADR. That just boggles my brain. I want to highlight each of your characters now. Jack, I'll start with you. What was it like, Phil? figuring out the right, dyn like the power dynamic to be like the right hand to to Bruno, just in terms of how they operate? Um, I've got to be honest, I'm not sure I actually gave it too much forethought before getting there. But me and Axel flew in together and we had a couple nights like making our way up through the wilderness before we actually made it to set. So we kind of organically formed like a bit of a, a bond anyway. So sort of by day one, it kind of just fell into place. There was definitely some unspoken history that, that yeah. I thought I could, like it was business as usual for them. Uh -huh. I loved how that came through, but without explanation. Yeah, I, think, I, guess, I guess just the fact that we'd already been on a journey through the wilderness before we even got to set sort of already cemented a bond there. You feel that. I mean, Mimosa, something similar for you, like we don't necessarily know precisely what she has gone through, but we can feel it in the way she carries herself and through your performance in general. So what kind of, I don't know if you want to like spell out a backstory, but what specific quality of hers did you always know you had to hold tight to in order to keep her consistent and represent some of that history? I was happy that kind of the, we talked about the dynamics with the with the girls in the in the trunk, and obviously I know is from the beginning like tough cookie, <laughs> maybe the toughest of them. Um, but you know, I mean, I'm Finnish. I know the word sisu. It was kind of I was taking, I was taking a little sisu with Aina from start start to to end, even if it's. Um, yeah, I think that's it. That's, as it's explained, it's impossible to translate, but that was something that I could read right from the title. This is what we're going to need also to, to Aino's character, not not only Artemis. Can 100% feel that in her as well. Axel, 
I, I don't want to obviously spoil anything, but one thing I'm very curious about, ultimately in the end, if he could go back to the beginning and make a different decision in terms of going after him, do you think he would? Or do you think he was doomed to go down that path no matter what or lead his men down that path? I think, I think he's doomed to go down that path. Uh, obviously, he would have changed some, some ways, but I think he is an alpha, alpha male that n will never, ever uh, feel the defeat even if he loses, you know, like he is the kind of man that won't um, accept the loss. So I think he would go back and just try it again, just see if he could go again. He will, he would lose again, but I don't think he has the necessary insight to overlook and oversee what what Atomi is and 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 how what Sisu is. So in conclusion, you should turn this into a time loop movie and we can see a different variation with every installment. Yeah, I had <laughs> so much trouble of uh, figuring out how Adam actually will kill all these Nazis that I couldn't do it again. <laughs> I feel like you've probably been asked this a million times and it hurts me that I'm going to have to ask you, but what, did you ever think of what he might want to do with that gold? Yeah, that... That was my biggest challenge when I was writing, like, uh, like how can I end this? What, what Adam would do? Because I somehow knew that he won't be any happier with the gold or uh, because he's a man who likes to do stuff. And if you get that amount of money and like, it's not going to be a happy end. And then I realized that we have to stop the film into the bank. So but I gave it a lot of thought and, and I think he would be like so badly alcoholic, how do you say it? Alcoholic. Alcoholic, alcoholic and spending somewhere in, in a hotel of Las Palmas or something and being really sad. Dude, my heart. <laughs> like a Nick Cage leaving Las Vegas, just yeah, <laughs> drinking himself to death. Have any of you ever come up with like creative endings for him to the movie? <laughs> no, but we were talking about it because I think, I mean, at, at the end of the day, the, the, uh, the story is not about the gold. The story is about um, the gold starts it. It's, it's about a man working for something for a very long time, hard to get it, and somebody steals it. And he doesn't, they don't, they don't steal even, they don't steal his gold, they steal his dignity. They steal his pride. And, and so this, the object is gold, but the theme of the film, I feel, is about humanity. It's about um, self-respect. It's about revenge. It's about dignity. Uh, and it's about pride. And it's about... Um, blowing up Nazis. Huh? And blowing up Nazis. And blowing up Nazis. But it's, it's at, at, the, at the end of the day, we were talking about it. I think Bruno and and uh, Atami would use the money and the gold for the same thing. And it, will, it would give them both misery. Because the, 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 like, like Yalmari says, the, the answer is, doesn't lay in the gold. That's not the answer. The answer is surviving, right? I don't know what this says about me, just like reaching for hopeful <laughs> things, but I'm like, like what you just described about him is right, but he's going to use the gold to like fight for other people to preserve that and them to make that sure might other be, don't that do might that. be, <laughs> that might be, that might be. Desperately reaching for silver linings always. I have to let you all go. Thank you so much thank for you. the movie thank and you. for coming and here can to I just talk please, about it. Can I just please thank you for really good questions and yeah. an enormous insight and 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 a love for cinema that is inspiring and clear. Thank you so much. Almost thank crazy. you. This clip forever. It means a lot that you said that. Thank you to everybody out there. Thanks for watching this uh, interview. Do not forget to look out for Sisu. Trust me, it's excellent. We'll see you soon.